This is a transaction is, is one of the major concepts that makes the uh, internet That's commerce work. Okay, so this is section 8.5 in the book. Transactions is for managing large databases which keep track of a lot of information. In companies, for example, uh, or banks, you have your bank account, everyone has their bank account, or you buy books from Amazon, all the stock information, accounting information, everything is stored in there. So it's crucial, okay? And for a big company, there are many people doing things. It used to be, in the 19th century, that all of this was done by hand in large books called ledgers, and you had lots of accountants in a big room writing in these books, okay? That has all now been changed, and it's all happening inside of databases. So these databases have three properties, and the transactions are going to be designed for all three. First of all, they have to be resilient. That means the information must never disappear or be corrupted, because the information is critical for the companies using it, or for someone keeping track of anything. It's critical information, so it must never be corrupted or disappear. Transactions are going to support that. Second, high performance. You may have millions of customers or thousands, and they all want to do things. And the slower it goes, the worse it is. So the performance has to be high, and also, finally, scalable. That means you should be able to increase the number of users. Companies that grow, they need to keep these two properties, resilience and performance, for high scale. So we have these three properties for databases. And the point of transactions is to get all three, okay? To explain it, here's an example, just to motivate. This is a database. It's an array of cells. Uh, you can update all of it. There's a thousand, but usually there's millions or billions of them. And there's a lock here. If I am a client and I want to do something, maybe it's bank account and I want to transfer money from C1 to C2, what I do is I ask for the lock, and once I have the lock, I update C1 and C2, and then I release the lock. Okay? So that works, but it's not very good. Performance is very low, because you have one lock protecting the whole array. So only one client can modify at the same time, okay? So that's slow, uh, and it's a bottleneck, yeah? If you have millions of people doing updates, thousands per second, that lock, everyone's gonna be waiting for that lock, yeah? So this is, this works, but it, and you can see the motivation, huh? You have a lock because you have concurrent updates, you have more than one update, and so on, huh? You see it, huh? And the way to solve it, what we're going to do is we're going to have a smarter implementation where you have one lock per cell, okay? And next to all the data, you have lots of locks, okay? That's pretty smart because now I can do things here and I can do things here, and I only have to lock the cells that I'm actually using, okay? So that can be much faster and it's still going to be protecting the cells. But now things get more complicated. What if I have conflicting updates? Here's an example. Each cell is storing the amount of a bank account, 100 euros here, 100 euros here. Now let's say C1 is transferring money to C2, and C3 is also transferring money to C2. Okay, C2 is very happy getting money from those two guys. Mm -hmm. And in order to do this transfer, the, this is a transaction. And that transaction is an update huh, of the database. The update will modify C1 and C2. So it reduces the amount in C1 and it increases the amount in C2. 
And so that is supposed to be like one atomic action so that uh, the total amount does not change huh, in the database. Now the second update will modify C2 and C3. It transfers money, so it locks both, it transfers money, and then it unlocks. But what if those two are overlapping? What if T1 is reading C1, and then the scheduler puts it to sleep? T2 now does everything, okay? It goes from C3 to C2, and then the scheduler wakes up T1 again, and it writes C2. Well, the money that comes in from T2 has disappeared. Okay, and so this money, poof, has vanished, and the database is incorrect. So you can see that this potentially can be a lot smarter, but you have to be very, very clever in how you let those transactions work together. If they have anything in common, like C2, you have to be very careful, okay? So this is the idea. And the rest of the lecture today is explaining how to make it work, okay? And you'll see how, how we can make actually very nice things. Okay, so let me summarize now what we want to do. We want to do an update, okay? And it modifies multiple things, like moving one money from one account to another. So again, it's a large atomic action, so it's all atomic. Okay, and each update is doing all or none, okay? It must not see the intermediate states of the other ones because they're incorrect. The database is only correct after the update is completely done. Huh? It removes money from C1, and, when it, and at that point the database is, is inconsistent, huh? and it's only when the money goes back into C2 that it's consistent again. So the intermediate states have to be invisible. Now there's a second thing. This is new now. The system can crash at any time. Again, we want to be resilient. This thing is a real world uh, system running on a computer. The system can crash at any time and we want the data to stay good. The database is stored on disk permanently. So it's there even if the power goes down. But we want to make sure the disk never has corrupted data. So how do we do that? Because we're going to do multiple changes on the disk, okay? And the disk can crash at any time. Uh, the power can go down any time. So this does not seem to be so easy, huh? The trick is the following, that when you make the updates of a transaction, you store them on one place of the disk. You don't update the rest yet. And when the whole update is complete, and it's all on the disk, but in a special place, then you write one word to the disk to switch the content from the old to the new place, okay? So you need one hardware property of the disk. You, can do, you have to have a writing of one word on the disk must be atomic, okay? So if the disk crashes, either the word is written or it's not, not partially written, okay? So that's the hardware property that we need. That's pretty easy to satisfy. Huh? The hardware has to be written made to satisfy that. And then, but using this idea uh, of using a special place on the disk, you can uh, make the whole update be atomic. So if there's a crash anytime during these updates, during the update, then when you reboot the disk, you will restore the old value. The new place of the disk has corrupted data, you ignore it. Okay? So this is how you can have commit or abort. Okay? So that's the one thing. So that's the, 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 the resilience property. Now, the system has to be fast, of course. Huh? Uh, you can have many transactions executing, many updates. That means you don't always keep them on disk. You do them in RAM, in fast memory, okay? And only sometimes you write to disk. That means if you have it in the RAM and the system crashes, 
poof, it disappears, of course. Huh? So you're paying a little bit a price here when, uh, for the, what happens when it crashes. But since crashes are rare, they happen not often, that's not a, a problem. Okay? You want to make it as fast as possible in the case when it does not crash. Okay? Because that's by far the most common. Okay? So that's the idea. Those are the basic techniques. And I'm going to now explain how to, to do it. Okay? Uh, there is a, an acronym. Transactions, very often people say they have ACID property because this is an acronym that actually combines four important properties of transactions, uh, ACID. And so you'll see that a lot when you read about transactions, uh, asset, asset, da, da, da. So I explained just what they mean, but it, I've already explained it. Eh? It's just that I want to say these, these, uh, the acronym. So A is for atomic, and you know what that means. It's either all or none, none of it, no intermediate state is visible. Uh, this crash will be an abort, so you see no changes and there's no corruption. So that's atomic. C is consistency. Consistency means the database has an invariant. Like in a bank, the total amount of money is always the same. Okay, The bank is not printing money, it's not like the federal uh, the national bank or something. It's just transferring money around, but the total amount of money has to always be the same. So that's an invariant. And whenever you do a transaction, it has to, of course, respect that and not create or make money disappear, okay? And that's called consistency. Notice this one is actually the responsibility of the programmer. Huh? So atomic is the actual implementation, but consistency the transaction has to be written correctly, but then the implementation has to make sure that it doesn't change what the programmer has written. Huh? So that's consistency. I is isolation, okay? So isolation is a little bit related to, to atomic. So atomic is all or none, but isolation is talking about two transactions. So they never interfere with each other. Uh, each one might be atomic, but they might still kind of interfere. So isolation means that if you have two concurrent transactions, it's always as if they're executing sequentially. Uh, if I have T1 and T2 and they're overlapping, then the actual behavior, it's as if T1 is before T2 or T2 is before T1. So that's the semantics. But the implementation, of course, is going to do them in parallel uh, for performance. But the, the update in the database will be as if one of them happened before the other. As if they execute sequential order. This is also called serializability. They can be serialized. You can do them as if they're in some sequential order. So isolation and serializability is actually the same property, with different name. Okay. Uh, only for the acronym, it's easy to pick isolation because then you have acid, it doesn't work for serializability. Yeah. And then the final one is durability. This is the, the, the fact that the information is permanent, it's on a stable storage, and it survives even if the power goes down and system crashes. This one is also called persistence, so these are synonyms. Again, people take durability because of the acronym, huh? but very often it's called persistence, okay? So you can see the properties here. Huh? So we have to maintain all of, all of these properties. So I explained how durability is maintained, and there's a lot of uh, clever tricks to make the disk go well, but I'm not going to say some more. I told you the basic idea. So the rest of the lecture is going to be mostly about these properties, A, C, I, okay? So that's uh, asset properties. And in fact, you don't always need durability. There is a thing called software transactional memory. You can actually use transactions in your programs uh, to handle software bugs. Uh, this is like a lock, a lock that can abort. 
So it's like a kind of a locker, an abortable atomic action. So this is called a lightweight transaction, and this does not have the disk, the durability. Yeah? Uh, it can replace locks when there's a chance of abort. And uh, aborts can happen, huh? all software can have bugs. So if you really want to build reliable software, this can be useful, even if there's nothing on the disk. Okay. So these are this is a transaction without uh, durability. It's exactly like a lock, except it has a second output, huh? Commit, abort. So the normal output of the lock is commit, huh? when you do all the changes. But abort is when you have no changes. Okay. Okay, so all of that is now introduction, and now I want to explain how we actually implement the transactions. And there's many, many ways. Huge books have been written on it. There's a huge amount of stuff. So I'll give you first kind of an introduction to it. The whole area of building systems to do transactions has a name. It's called concurrency control. Okay. It's not called uh, transaction uh, implementation or something. No, it's called concurrency control. Why? Because it's kind of historical. It used to be like in the 1960s when IBM was still the big uh, boss of computing and companies started building databases, and companies started doing transactions. Then Transactions was like the only concurrent thing people were doing, so this was concurrency, okay? So this thing is called concurrency control. So the techniques to build transactional systems is called concurrency control, and this is a huge area, okay? So today you get an introduction to this. And today I'm going to show you one algorithm for implementing transactions. So this is the lightweight transactions, so I won't say more about persistence or durability. Uh -huh. I gave you the basic idea where you have a switch, one word right on the disk, but I won't say more about that because that's kind of a separate thing. I'll explain to you how to do lightweight transactions. And the algorithm we're going to do today, you can summarize it with the following phrase, optimistic concurrency control with strict two-phase locking and deadlock avoidance. Each of these red parts is a property, and there can be many different properties, okay? So optimistic, you can also have pessimistic. Uh, strict two-phase locking, you can also have non-strict two-phase locking. Deadlock avoidance, you can also have deadlock uh, detection, and not avoidance. So this is one out of many possible algorithms, okay? This, is, this algorithm is implemented in two pages of code, and it's actually implemented using active objects. It's implemented using multi-agent style, and uh, this is the most complicated algorithm in the book, okay? And I'll show you, I'll give you an example of what you can see in this algorithm, uh, because it's doing a lot of things. So this idea of transactions, it seems very simple, but actually to make it really work the, the algorithm has to do a lot of things, okay? So let me now explain the different axes, the different variations, okay? First of all, the system can be optimistic or pessimistic, and I'll explain what that means. Optimistic means, it, it means how often are they actually giving locks. So when a transaction needs a lock on a cell, it asks the transaction manager, okay? And the transaction manager can respond different ways. It can say, yes, here's the lock, or it can say, no, and then the transaction has to abort, or it can say, wait, and the transaction has to wait. And if the, if, uh, sometimes it can be optimistic, that means it's giving locks, even if it might increase the chance of abort later on. Or it can be uh, pessimistic, where it's very, very trying to avoid aborts. So we'll see some examples of this. So this is depending on cost of failure. There's also the lock management. This is the serializability. Remember the example where T1 and T2, they were overlapping, and the, number, the amount in the bank was wrong? 
Well, that was not serializable, so the lock management avoids that, okay? So it's giving the locks, and it's sometimes asking the transactions to wait, so that you always can make it serializable, so I'll explain that. And the final one is a really interesting one called deadlock management. Deadlock is a situation that can happen in, in a database, but also in the real world. Uh, this is when you have circular dependencies. Uh, when I need two things, and somebody else needs two things, I, like, I need a, a fork and a knife to eat. The other person also needs a fork and a knife, but there's only one fork and knife. I take the fork, the other person takes the knife, and I want the knife now, and the other person wants the fork. So we're obviously we're sitting there waiting for the other one. So this is a circular dependency, and the system blocks forever. Okay. So we'll talk about that too. And then I'll talk about the consistency and the, the, the execution properties. And there's two properties for this. Safety. So safety has to do with invariance, like the amount of money in the, in the bank is always constant. Okay. And liveness means the system makes progress. That means transactions sometimes commit. They're not always aborting. That's why they always abort. Then there's no progress, huh? And you need both of these properties. And then I'll talk about some of the building blocks. So this is built using locks, and then a new thing called the timestamps. Okay. Uh, so the locks are important for safety, and the timestamps. Uh, which are like incremented, they will uh, give transactions priorities. So some transactions will execute before others, so that if there's two transactions kind of interfering, one of them is given priority, okay? So that the system can go forward. So that's important for lives, okay? So this gives you like a summary roadmap of what we're going to see. All of these concepts, I'm going to explain them now, huh? So the whole, all of this kind of gives you, covers you the whole area of concurrency control. Okay, uh, okay. So what I want to do now is before, before I talk about uh, actual transaction manager, I want to talk about safety and liveness. So you may have, you may already know what these properties are. Have you seen these properties in your previous course? No. Anyone seen them? If you've seen them, raise your hand. Nobody. Okay, so that means it's very good that I talk to them because they're very important. And not just for transactions, for everything. But here's a good time to explain them because they're especially important for transactions. Okay. So we want to build a system, a software system that does things. And it has to do things in the right way. Okay. And there's two kinds of properties called safety and liveness properties. And I'll give you intuition, but I'll also give you formal definition, okay? So safety property means bad things never happen. And a liveness property says that good things will eventually happen. So the safety is like the invariant, and the liveness is the progress. Uh, example is like when you're driving a car, Safety means you don't have an accident, okay? You don't crash the car, that's safety property. Liveness means you actually get to the destination. I want to go to the seaside, to the beach. I actually arrive there, that's a liveness property, okay? So you want both of them, huh? And always you need to have both, okay? Okay, so let me make it a little bit more formal now. A property, P, is a function of an execution. So you have a whole execution of the system starting, going on forever, maybe, huh? potentially forever, a long time. So a database normally never stops. Huh? It goes on forever, years and years. And the execution we saw already in a previous course is a sequence of uh, execution states. So ST is the stack and sigma is the memory. Huh? So the stack is all the, the so this is the instructions that you're executing, and this is the data. So each arrow is one instruction, not a step. So this is is modeling an execution, and we saw actually a formal model of this an abstract machine that can actually explain that. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to go over the formal model again, 
but I just want you to remember that this is how you model an execution. It's an infinite sequence of execution states where each state is instructions plus memory. Uh, instructions. So this ST is like a, uh, um, a set of stacks, uh, multiple threads maybe. So each thread is one stack and sigma is the memory, okay? which is both single assignment and cell memory, both of them. So this is the execution state. So that's the execution and the property is a function that, of that that gives true or false. Okay? That's, that's the thing we're going to talk about. Now I want to explain, before we give the definition, that it turns out that any property at all, any property P that you can define, you can always express it as a combination of safety and liveness. That's a very profound mathematical theorem that you can show, okay? Any property, so a Boolean function of an execution, can, is a safety and a liveness property. So a safety property is something that bad things never happen, and a liveness is that there's progress. Okay, we'll, we'll make a formal definition of these two, and then you'll see exactly what it means. But this is actually really interesting. It means when you define your system, you just can you just have to worry about safety and liveness. You don't have to worry about anything else. Okay, you can actually look up this proof. This is a famous uh, result from 1985. It, it's very mathematical. It uses topology. Uh, so, so this is a, a formal mathematical property. So I won't explain the proof here because this is not a course in mathematics. But if you're interested. It's actually quite an inter quite, uh, interesting paper, and you can easily find it, okay? By Alpern and Schneider. So we're going to use that. So now I want to define formally what is a safety and what is liveness properties, okay? In order to define formally, we are going to talk about executions. Um, so here's execution, and we're going to introduce two notions. One is the prefix, and the other one is an extension. So a prefix of execution is the beginning, is the first k execution states, uh, for some k. So you chop it off at some point. So that's the beginning of the execution that's called the prefix, okay? A finite beginning. So the k is always some number. And an extension is you take the prefix and then you keep going. You start, you start executing from the end of the prefix and you keep going. So maybe it's not the same as the original execution. You can go in different directions here, right? But you start in the same way as the original one. And then you go and you start keep executing. So that's the uh, uh, second concept. So to define safety and liveness, we are going to use prefix and extension. Okay. So here's the definition of safety. Uh, I give you an informal version, and then I give you the formal version. So I have P of E, uh, property of an execution. It's safety if every execution violating P goes bad. That means there's an event such that every executing starting like E and behaving like E up to some bad event, some bad thing, Violate P regardless of what it does after. So basically, the system breaks. Uh, uh, I like to have the example where I, I have an egg, uh, a raw egg, uh, enough crew, and I'm carrying it, and I drop it. Splash. Well, that's not nice. Well, the egg is broken, okay? And whatever I do after that, the egg stays broken. So I've broken the system. So, uh, Violating safety means the system actually like breaks. Uh, something happens, a bad event, and there's no way to fix it. So everything you do after will always, the system will always be broken. Uh, when execution goes bad, it stays bad. You cannot fix it. Okay? So that's the way to define safety. And this is the formal definition. 
Given an execution such that P of E is equal to false, so it violates safety, yeah? So any execution that violates safety, there exists a prefix such that every extension of that prefix uh, is also false. Okay? So F is an extension of this prefix, and P of will, will always be false. That means uh, there is a prefix, the beginning, and the system is broken. And no matter what you do, every extension gives false. No matter what you do after it stays broken. Uh, too bad. You cannot repair the egg. Okay, when I crash my car, well, it's crashed. You know? So uh, it's broken. So you cannot fix a broken system. So that's a safety property. If a, if a property is such that you cannot fix it, then it's a safety property, okay? So here's an example in computer system. So I have messages going between multi-agents. Remember multi-agents, huh? And here's the safety property. A message sent is delivered at most once. So if I have two agents, I send a message, so it arrives at most once. Maybe it disappears because of failure, but it, it arrives once, but not more than once, okay? You can break that, huh? The way to break it is to make the message arrive more than once, okay? If it arrives more than once, then there's no way to, to fix it because it's already, you can't un-arrive a message. It's arrived more than once, it's broken, okay? So if the message is delivered more than once, you take the part of the execution where it's delivered more than once, you stop there, no matter what you do after that, any extension, you can't undeliver the message, so it will always stay broken. So every extension will also be broken, of course. Huh? So this property is, you can break it. So a property that you can break like that is a safety property, yeah? Okay, so this is like the bank account money. Once the amount of money in the bank is wrong, then it's wrong, okay? The bank is broken. What's, uh, there's, there's not, the money is not good anymore. Okay, on the other side, you have liveness. So it's kind of the opposite of safety. Uh, so again, I have a P of E, a property of execution, Assume now that P of E is true. The liveness for the whole execution is true. Then there, for every prefix, there exists an extension so the PF, and PF is true. That means, assume now I do something and the liveness is not true yet. I can always do something to make it true, okay? As long as there is life, there is hope. That actually captures it pretty well. Uh, as long as the execution continues, even if it's false now, I can always may make it true. Uh, there's always something I can do to make it true. So any property that's like that is aliveness. So I'm driving my car, okay, and I want to go to the beach, uh, not now, but in the summer, and, um, and I make a mistake. Uh, I end up, uh, I end up in the Alps, okay, somewhere in the mountains. So I'm very wrong. But there's still hope because I can still change direction and go to the beach, okay? There's always a way to go back to the beach. So you can always find a way to fix it. So any property that like that, that's like that, that even when it's not true, you can always do something to fix it, that's aliveness, okay? So here's aliveness. Again, with the message example, liveness is the message is delivered at least once. So once or more, okay? So if I have a prefix of any execution, if the message already arrived in there, then I'm fine. Any extension will satisfy P. Maybe the message arrives more than once, that's good. But if the prefix does not have the message, I can always make it true by adding the delivery, okay? There's always a way to make it true. That's 
lifeless. You can always do something that makes it true. Maybe you, you have to do something. Yeah? It's not going to be automatically true, but you can always do something to make it true. Okay? And to summarize this, this is the way I like to see is like this. This is a visual way. Uh -huh. Your mileage may vary. Some people don't like this kind of way, but for me, this is a good way. So you can see the difference between the two. So the top picture is safety and the bottom is liveness. So here I've been execution. Okay. Okay. Uh, so if, assume the safety is false here, then there exists a prefix such that all extensions are false. So no matter what you do, the system is broken and stays broken. Okay. Liveness is kind of the opposite. So assume an execution where liveness is true, then for all prefixes, no matter which one, even if it's false here, you can always find a way to make it true. There exists at least one way to make it true. So that's a liveness property. Okay? So you can see they're kind of dual properties, huh? If you look at it like that. Uh, okay? And to finish on that, let me give just some intuitions. How do you know when something is safety and live or live? Safety can only be really satisfied when you look at the whole execution. You're never really completely safe, huh? You're driving a car, you can always have an accident. Huh? So during the execution, you, you never really know that you're completely safe. You can only you know that after the execution is done. So infinite time. When I say infinite time, I mean at the end of the execution. Okay? And it violates infinite time, when you have the accident. Okay? And if you have properties where you have the word never, at most, cannot, it's kind of safety. These are safety words. Partial correctness is a safety thing. Okay? And liveness is very opposite to that. So you can satisfy it in finite time. So the good thing, it has to, happens in finite time. Okay? And when it's satisfied, you're alive. There's only, the only way to know that the system is completely dead, okay, not alive, is to go to the end of the execution, and then if you see that the good thing never happened, then it's not live, okay? But while it's executing, there's always hope. You can always make it live, okay? And here's some liveness words, eventually must do this at least, okay? Termination is liveness property your algorithm terminates, okay? So that's basically telling you safety and liveness. It's very important for transactions, but it's important for all systems that you build, huh? So it's good to know what it is, okay? Here's some questions for making you think. I will not give the answers to these questions today, but I will give them next week, okay? Okay, we define safety as a predicate of an execution. Why not define it uh, as a predicate? So we define safety like this, a property of the whole execution, P of E. We could do something different, okay? Why not define it for execution states? Uh, so, uh, if you crash the car, well, the state is the car is crashed. So, maybe it's simpler, instead of having E, which is this big thing, uh, full execution, why not make it just true for individual states? So, the system is safe if it's true for every single state. You see, this is actually a different way of defining safety. Yeah? EI is a single execution state. So here I'm saying that all states are safe, whereas here I'm saying the whole execution is safe. Okay? But these P's are different properties. Different. Uh, this is one property of a state. This is property of an execution. There's actually very different ways of defining, very different way of defining safety. And the question is, 
Uh, I actually defined it like this, huh? but you could define it like this. So this is kind of to make you think about the fundamentals. Why not define execution safety for states? Why not? Huh? And a long time ago, like in the 1980s or 90s, people did it. So it's not so completely obvious why this is actually not as good. Huh? Doing it like this is actually not as good as doing it like that. Why not? Okay? I want you to think about that. You can maybe find the answer by searching, googling a bit, huh? But I'm not going to say it today. I will say it next week. Okay? Here's another question. I told you that every property uh, can be safety and liveness. So there are safety properties and liveness properties. What about the property every message should be delivered exactly once time? Not at least, not at most, but exactly once. So what about this one? Is it safety or liveness? So what happens with this property? If you think a little, you, this is actually an easy question if you think a little bit. Remember I showed you that at least once uh, is a liveness, but at most once is a safety property. Yeah? What about exactly once? What's that? What do you think? Anybody have an idea on that one? No? Yeah? It's, <coughs> it's both. <coughs> it's both? What do you mean? <coughs> How can it be uh, both? Um, because it exactly once is at most once and at least once at the same time. And you said that earlier. Ah, uh, it's at most once and at least once. So what I actually, I actually make, I'm writing it this to confuse you. Huh? What I said that every property can be a conjunction is safety and liveness. Huh? So you're right. So this is actually a conjunction. This is a safety and a liveness property. Yeah? I never said that every property is either safety or liveness. Huh? I said that every property can be written as a conjunction of a safety and a liveness. So this one can be written as conjunction. Huh? So that's the answer for this question. Huh? So you have to understand that. Huh? If you don't understand it completely, you think about it and look at the definitions. But this first part is a little bit harder. You have to think a little bit more. Really, why is defining safety as a property of executions, why that's not really good enough? Okay, if you do that, then your safety is not really good enough. Why not? Okay. So here, I'm not, I'm not going to say more than this one. This one, I want you to think a little bit. Okay. Good. So that's all I'm going to say about safety and liveness, and we're going to use it for the transactions. Now I come back to transactions. Okay. Now I want to talk about concurrency control. So now we're going to implement the transactions with safety and liveness. Okay. And in order to implement it, we're going to define a transaction system, an architecture. Okay, so how do you write the code for this? Okay, here I have transactions, T1 to Tn, and I have a transaction manager, Tm. Okay, each transaction is a piece of code running in one thread, and the transaction manager also is a piece of code, and they're like active objects if you want them. These, each of these is an active object. And the concurrency control is implemented inside TM. Okay? And how does it work? Well, the transaction wants to do updates of cells, but before it updates the cell, it has to ask, it has to lock the cell. So what it does, whenever it needs a lock, it asks the transaction manager, it says, please give me the lock for cell 25. Okay? And the transaction manager will reply. It will say, yes, you have the lock. Or it will say, no, I am not giving you the lock. Or it will wait. 
It will not reply immediately. It will let the transaction wait. Okay. So those are the three possible answers. Okay. And then when the transaction is done and it does not need the lock anymore, it says, I'm done. I don't need the lock for cell 25 anymore. It says, uh, please, uh, you can have the lock back. It tells the transaction manager that it doesn't need the lock anymore. Okay. So that's how it works. So this is not that complicated, huh? You can see what happens in some cases, huh? If the transaction manager says no, that's actually pretty bad. It means the transaction has to abort, poor guy, huh? Has to abort. That's it. He's done, he aborts. Uh, delay, that's more usual. Maybe he doesn't give it right away, okay? Waits a little bit. Because maybe some other transaction is using it. And you have to wait until the other one frees it, or for some other reason. Maybe for serializability, you have to wait a little bit, okay? Or you can give it right away, okay? So you, can, you see how it works, huh? So there's always messages going between each of these transactions and the transaction manager, and you can create new ones, huh? Whenever you want. A new transaction, it's like a new active object. And when a transaction is done, poof, it disappears, huh? So this thing is always running like that, huh? So it's not so complicated, huh? With this now, we can, we can go back to our concurrency control ideas. And uh, the three main things here, optimism versus pessimism, the serializability, lock management, and the deadlocks. Uh, deadlock is a special thing which, we will, which can happen and which we will have to handle, okay? And all of this is, is satisfying safety and liveness, and it's using locks and timestamps. So locks we know already, okay? But you don't need only locks. You need also this new thing, timestamps, okay? Okay, fine, let's go now to optimism versus pessimism. This is a really neat kind of concept. A transaction asks for a lock, okay? The transaction manager, it can give the lock or not, or ask the, the, let the transaction wait. Now, it depends on the cost of failure. If aborting is very bad, and we don't ever want transactions to abort, then the transaction manager will not be so fast in giving locks. Because if you give too many locks, at some point, you might have to cause a transaction to abort because one transaction will need the lock that's held by another one, and they're both waiting, and the only way is to cause one to abort, okay? So, uh, so that's, that's if you're optimistic and you give locks too much, then you might have to force transactions to abort. So if you don't want aborts, then you have to be pessimistic. That means you, you are very prudent and you don't give luck so much, okay? Or on the other hand, if more transactions means more profits and if failure is no big deal, if we don't care if they abort, but the more transactions are running, the more profit you make, of course, it'll be optimistic, okay? So here's two examples of this. One of them is, and you have already experienced both in your life, one is airline booking. Okay. This is an example of optimistic scheduling. A passenger booking a seat, you have a seat in the air in the flight, is a transaction. Okay. And you get the seat, it's it's you have it, okay? It's committed, like uh, but that's not really the way it's done. Airlines will almost always they overbook flights. Okay. They will sell more tickets than seats on the plane, okay? On the plane, not plane, not plane. And they will sell more, and maybe 20% more or something, a lot. Why is that? Because sometimes people cancel. And if people cancel, that's an empty seat. And airplanes are very expensive to fly, okay? The airline wants to have a high number of filled seats. When the plane is flying, it has to have as many seats filled as possible. So people might cancel. And then, even if there's a cancellation fee or something, still the airline is, they don't like that. It's, 
It's like the last for them, okay? So they will overbook. But the problem is, maybe you arrive uh, at the airport and there's no seat, okay? I don't know if you ever got that situation before. I have had that situation several times. Uh, of course, the passenger is not happy. I, I want to go to New York. Oh, sorry, there's no more seats. What? I have, t I have bought a ticket. Yeah, no more seats. So the airline, that happens. So you have to f abort that transaction, okay? So it's not really committed until you're sitting in the plane, okay? Before you go in the plane, it's not actually committed. Even though you think it's committed, you have the ticket, you don't have the seats. See, so, so the, the, the giving the lock is like, uh, you, 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 you let all these transactions run, but they don't actually commit, okay, until the, the plane starts flying, okay? Usually the airline tries to make people happy. So uh, if you don't have a seat, they'll say, well, they will book you on the next flight, but they will say, here's a voucher for 300 euros for the next flight. So they give you some kind of a compensation to make you happy, okay? But sometimes it's nasty, uh, there's no more flights, so they put you in a hotel or whatever. So they do something. But for the airline, it's much better to do that than to have less seats on the flight. And it's very bad empty seats for the airline, okay? So that's an example of optimistic scheduling, you see? Because the price of failure is actually very low. And, uh, and they really want as many uh, seats filled as possible. That's the problem. Okay, so that's optimistic. Here's an example of pessimistic. This is railroads, tracks, okay? So a, a train is going on a piece of track. So basically it has reserved that track. It says, that track is for me at this time. And that reservation is a transaction, okay? I, I need those tracks to run and I get it, I'm committed, okay? I can run at 10, 1035, I will run on that track. Now, you're not going to reserve, the, let that track be reserved by more than one transaction, huh? If two trains go on the same track at the same time, it's not good, huh? There's an accident and people die and stuff. So the cost of failure here is very high. So you never want these transactions to abort. So aborting here means that the train cannot actually run on the track. And, and even the abort can be because of an accident. Huh? It's not just the, the, the signal and saying, no, you can't go. It's actually an accident that happens. So you're, it's like a forced abort. Huh? So this is very bad. Huh? It's in the newspapers, people die and stuff. That means you have very pessimistic scheduling. And when you drive, go on a train, sometimes the train stops in the middle of nowhere. You have probably noticed that. And you sit there. Why does it stop? Well, because there's a red light. Why is there a red light? Well, because maybe another train is coming on a track farther on, and they're very, very, very prudent. But maybe the other train is late or whatever. Maybe there's no other train. But still, they will let you stop because the cost of failure is so high, okay? So this is an example of pessimistic. So you don't actually give the locks uh, very often uh, on, a, on a segment. Uh, you only give it when you're really, really sure, okay? Uh, so two transactions, one of them will lock and get it, but the other one asks for the lock on that segment, will not get it until the first train has actually passed on the segment that gone away, until it's sure there's no accident possible, okay? So that's how that one works. So you see the difference? So all transaction managers are kind of, there's a flavor, huh? They can either be more or less optimistic or pessimistic, huh? You kind of see the idea. And you see that transactions are a very general thing. It happens in many, many cases in the real world. Huh? It's not just databases, huh? Okay? Like also Amazon selling books, huh? Okay, Amazon selling you a book. 
and you buy the book and you pay, that's a transaction. And you think you're going to get the book when you do that. But will you get the book? Because sometimes it's possible before the, the book has actually been sent, you can actually cancel your order. Huh? There's a short period. So who knows? Maybe Amazon will sell the book to two people and one person will not get the book and get a refund. Actually, it has happened to me several times that I order something from Amazon and I don't get it, but I get a refund. Have you ever had that happen? Well, it, for me, that smells like Amazon is overselling their stuff, okay? Uh, all of a sudden, there's no more books because maybe someone else has already bought it. So they're being a little bit too optimistic there. Uh, because the price of failure is not so high, it's just an unhappy customer, but the, you, I get my refund, so I don't lose any money, I just don't have the book, okay? So the price of failure is not so high, people don't die, okay? I'm not, they're not going to come and stick a knife in me, uh, it's not like the train, huh? where people die here. The airline booking is kind of annoying, but people don't die, but the railway track, you, you have to be very careful, huh? Okay, so that's optimistic and pessimistic. That gives you an idea. Let me now make a small break. And after that, we'll talk, we'll go to the real heart of it, which is lock management. That's the real stuff, huh? Each transaction is aligned, okay? The time is going to the right. And whenever it gets a lock, it actually makes like uh, boxes, blocks. Whenever it gets a lock, I put a block there, and when it releases the lock, it goes back down. So the higher it gets, the more locks it has. Uh, so here, for example, T2 will get L1, and it's executing here. It will get L2, and then it releases L2 at some point, releases L1, and goes back. So the height is like the number of locks it has. Okay. This is a very common diagram, and it actually gives you a good good image of what's going on, okay? Here's a case when I'm naive. This is a naive solution of lock management. It means whenever I ask for a lock, if nobody else has it, the transaction manager will give it to me right away. If no other transaction is holding a transaction, well, yes, it's yours, okay? And that's actually naive and that's actually not good. And the reason why it's not good is it's not serializable. And here's an example. T1 is running code, and it wants to transfer money from C1 to C2. And T2 is running code, and it wants to calculate the total money I have in my accounts. So I have two accounts, okay? I have savings account, C1, and checking account, C2. And you can transfer money between one and the two. You know you've already done that. Okay, so that's what T1 is doing. T2 is calculating the total money I have in both accounts. Okay, so the way this naive solution works, T1, it wants to get the money from C1. So it asks for the lock. It, it loads the money in a local variable. And then it releases the lock. And later on, it asks for the lock on C2. It updates C2 and then it releases the lock. Okay? But in the middle, there's no lock because it has no locks. Okay? So this is the really naive one where the transaction manager is giving the lock right away. Huh? Here, T2 is coded a little bit differently. It gets first the lock on L1. So here, there's nobody. Huh? So it gets it, gets lock on L2. It does the calculation, displays the amount, whatever, and then it releases the locks one after the other. So this is wrong, huh? This is buggy. And the reason is, actually, it's not serializable. T1 and T2 is not serializable. You cannot say T1 is before T2 or after T2. Uh, because T1 will change the value of C1 here, but it does not change C2. So it actually, is, things are like inconsistent. So T2 will get an inconsistent C1 here, huh? and a consistent C2. So in this case, there's missing money because the money is released from, 
from uh, T1, from L C1, but not in put in C2 yet. Okay. And the reason is it's not serializable. The two transactions are interfering with one another. Okay. So how do you solve this? Well, the lock management has to be a little bit smarter. It's not allowed to release the lock before getting the next lock, in fact. Okay. And the usual way to do this is to the transaction gets all the locks before it computes and then it releases them. Okay, this is called two-phase locking. So here's another way of doing it, and this way is actually serializable. If I change the lock management, the way it does the following. I get L1, and then the transaction asks for L2, it gets both locks, and then it runs, okay, and then it releases L2, releases L1, and T2 is the same. So it actually has both locks at the same time. Okay. Uh, if I do it like this, then it will it will be serializable. Okay. So I remind you, serializable means it's as if they were executed sequentially. So in this case, T1 is actually going to be before T2. But maybe the scheduler is different and maybe T2 is before T1. But there's never interference. Because if T1 has L1, T2 cannot get L1 during this time, okay? T2 has to wait. So the first one that gets L1 will get it. And the other one will wait. So depending on which one gets L1 first, that's how we decide the order, okay? This technique, where you get all the locks first, and then you release them when you're done, this is called two-phase locking, okay? This is a very important technique and almost all transaction managers use some kind of two-phase locking. Why is it called two-phase? Because, because it has two phases. There's a phase when it's asking for locks. This is called growing phase. The number of locks is growing. And it, there's a shrinking phase when it's releasing the locks, okay? So while it's asking for locks, it's not allowed to release, okay? And when it starts releasing, it's not allowed to ask anymore. So it cannot go like this, huh? It has to go up, have all the, and then go down. Okay, if you do that, maybe you have the lock too long, huh? Maybe I don't need L1 the whole time. So you're kind of being a little bit conservative, huh? But the, but the result is it's serializable. Huh? Okay, so two-phase locking, almost all transaction managers, the lock management will be done like that. Okay, so when I ask for a lock, okay, I'm not allowed to release the lock. When I start releasing locks, I'm not allowed to ask anymore. So in, our, in, my, in my transaction manager, I'm asking for locks, okay, I'm getting them, and I, I can start releasing locks. If I ask for a lock again, after I've released, then the transaction manager will say, sorry, buddy, and it aborts me, okay? So, you're, so that's illegal. After I'm starting to release, I'm not allowed to ask anymore. Okay, yeah? If one thread uh, lock asks for lock number one, and then lock number two, and the other thread asks for lock number two, and then lock number yes. one. One could get lock number one, right. the other lock number two, right. and they are both blocked. Then they are both deadlocked. Yeah. That's right. That's, a pro that's another problem I'll explain in a few minutes. Okay. Yes, so if T2 asks for T2, L2 first, and T1 asks for L1, and they're running concurrently, and each one has one of the locks, then they ask for the other one, but it can't get it because the other one's waiting, then that's a deadlock. So this two-phase locking does not solve deadlock. Deadlock is a separate problem, actually a very weird and strange problem that is that you have to solve separately. So this one will only guarantee serializable. It will not guarantee that you have no deadlocks. You can still have deadlock with this, okay? But I will explain deadlock in a few minutes and then you get you will get all the answers. So this only ensures serializability, okay? So two-phase locking 
growing and shrinking. If the log manager does that, then it's guaranteed, and you can prove the theorem. Uh, I will not prove it, but actually you can find it easily on the internet that it's serializable. Okay, that one of them will always be before. And if you have many transactions and they're all doing two-phase locking, then they will. The whole system will be serializable. Okay, it's very intuitive, also. Huh? I get all the locks, and then I do the work, and I release them. So I actually, at the middle here, I have everybody. I have all the locks I need, okay? And at that point, I can do computations, and then I start releasing. It's like I'm getting the locks in a group. Huh? I'm getting a group of locks here. So two-phase locking makes it serializable. But life is not so simple, of course. Huh? One of the reasons is deadlock as uh, someone mentioned. But there's another reason why two-phase locking. Usually, real systems, they don't exactly do this. They do little modification. Okay? And this is so widely used that I have to explain it. Now I assume I have two-phase locking, and so everything is serializable. So there's no bug, okay? No bug here. But let me show you a particular scenario with three transactions. Three transactions, they're dependent. That means they're cells in common. They, have, they, they modify uh, shared data, okay? So T1 starts, da -da 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 -da, it's doing its work, it's releasing, and here it releases L1, and once it releases L1, okay, but it's not finished yet, it still has another lock here, a final one, but it keeps for a long time. But it releases L1, and then at that point, T2 can get L1, fine. And it does its stuff, it gets more locks, da 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 da. And once it releases here L2, uh, it can get L2. This, as soon as this one is released, this one can get it, okay? So this is completely correct. Well, but look at this scenario. T1. Somehow, for some reason, it keeps this lock for a long time, and then it aborts. Ah, well, that means T2 and T3 have to abort too, okay? Because T2 is reading the value of the cell that was modified by T1, and T3 is reading the value of the cell that was modified by T2, okay? Now notice, this is still correct, huh? there's no bug here. No bug, huh? This is completely correct. But the problem is that if one transaction aborts, the system has to force the some other ones to abort too. It's kind of complicated. Okay, that's the problem. Uh, in order to implement this, uh, you have to keep track of all the dependencies. So T2 depends on T1, T3 depends on T2, and if T1 aborts, T2 and T3 have to abort. And it's always changing, these dependencies. Huh? So when T1 aborts, the value of C1, the cell 1, is restored. So, and all the values, C1, C2 also is restored. So T2 and T3 must abort as well. Okay. So this is completely correct. Huh? There's no bug here. This is serializable. This is very nice, except that implementing it is kind of complicated because the transactions are dependent. So the, the guys implementing the transaction managers, they don't like this because it makes the implementation complicated and it's kind of rare, it doesn't happen that often, but still you have to write a lot of code to handle this. Okay? So what they did is they changed a little bit the two-phase locking so this never happens. Okay? And this is called strict two-phase locking. Okay? And the way to fix it is to release all the locks at the same time. Not one after the other, but at the same time. So I'm releasing them all at the same time. And at that point, uh, the cascading abort, which is what this problem is called, huh? this is called cascading abort because you can have like a cascade of aborts. When I abort one transaction, many can abort. So to get rid of that, 
I release all the locks at the same time. So that's okay, yeah? that's still a two-phase locking, yeah? it's still serializable. But then, if I release them all at the same time, then when the next transaction starts, there's no lock that, that kind of lives on here, yeah? and that can mess things up if I abort later. Yeah? Nobody lives on here, so you cannot have a cascading abort. Okay? So to avoid the cascading abort, we do, and this is called strict two-phase locking, all locks are released at once. So almost all real commercial databases are doing this, okay? They are doing strict two-phase locking. And it's slightly uh, slower than regular because, in fact, instead of reduce, removing, releasing when I don't need it, I have to keep all the locks until the very end, until I don't need anything. So maybe I could release already L3 here, huh? and I could release L2 here earlier, but I'm, I will keep them longer. And the reason is to avoid cascading board. I will keep them all until I release the last lock. You see? So in fact, I'm actually keeping the locks longer than I really have to. Huh? It's not a bug, it's fine. I'm allowed to do that. It will slightly lower performance, but it makes the implementation much simpler because there's never a dependency now. When this transaction aborts, I never have to abort anybody else. Okay? So that's what most real systems are doing. Strict two-phase locking. Okay? But, so it seems we're almost done now. Okay, we have it. But, as one smart guy mentioned before, there's still a problem hanging over us. Huh? But we'll see that. So let me now make a simple transaction system using strict two-phase locking. Uh, it will do optimistic concurrency control with strict two-phase locking. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Okay, here's the algorithm. I call it naive algorithm. Huh? It's very simple. Uh, when a transaction requests a lock of an unlocked cell, it gets it. Uh, if the cell is already locked, the transaction waits. Okay? And when the transaction commits or aborts, it releases all the locks. Strict two-phase locking. So it's getting locks, but it's never going to release and then get after. Right? It'll never go down and up. When it releases, it releases all. Fine. This is completely serializable. Okay? And it's optimistic because when I request a lock, I immediately get it. The system doesn't care about whether that might cause a problem later on. I get it, okay? I immediately get it. Now, this is a little bit too optimistic, as we will see. Uh, it assumes that getting locked will not lead to problems later on. But in fact, there is a problem that can still happen. This is the deadlock problem. Deadlock is it's like an epiphenomenon. Huh? It's hard to predict. How do we know? It, 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 well, let me explain what it is, and you'll see how the deadlock occurs. Okay? And this is exactly the example that was mentioned before. So consider transactions T1 and T2. Each one uses two cells. And T1 starts by using C1 and then C2. T2 starts by using C2 and C1. Now, the scheduler can schedule them, they're concurrent, huh? So T1 will get C1's lock, and T2 will get C2's lock. So they both have one lock each. Okay? And then T2 will try to get, T1 will try to get C2, but it can't because T2 has it. So it waits until T2 releases C2. And T2 waits until T1 releases C1. So they're each waiting for the other one, and they wait forever. And the system is blocked. These two transactions are stopped. Okay? This is called deadlock. And this is a natural consequence of uh, having resources and having entities that need resources. There is no easy way to get around this. This is a fundamental problem, okay? 
So how do we solve this? Ah, we have to do something, of course. Huh? If we don't do anything, these two transactions will sit forever, they will use up resources, and eventually the whole system will be full of deadlocked transactions, and all the locks will be sitting there, taken by these deadlocked transactions, and the whole system basically stops doing anything, okay? So this is a main, major problem. We have to fix it, huh? But what is it exactly? Let's first try to understand, really, what is deadlock, okay? Deadlock is a very general thing, actually. It can happen in any kind of system, almost in the real world, when you have two kinds of things, active entities and resources. When you have active entities like people or cars or airplanes or whatever, or transactions, and you have resources. Uh, a resource is like a cell, it's something I need. And when I have it, nobody else can have it. So a resource here is something that when one of the entities has it, no other entity can have it, and that an entity needs more than one to do its work. Okay. So here we have T1, so C1 is locked by T1, and T1 is waiting for C2. But C2 is locked by T2, and T2 is waiting for C1. So we can make a graph here. This is a good way of looking at deadlocks. This is called the wait for graph. This is a formal structure. It has two kinds of nodes, transactions and cells, and it has two kinds of edges, arrows, huh? Waits for edges, from transaction to cells, and locked by edges from cell to transaction. Okay? And here we have a cycle, okay? A circle, closed circle. And any cycle in this graph is a deadlock. So we can def we define a deadlock as a cycle in the wait for graph. And any time you have a cycle there, then you will wait forever, okay? So you have to do something when you have cycles. Here we have a cycle with two transactions, but you can have cycles with more, right? three, four, more. I can have T1 waiting for T2, waiting for T3, waiting for T1. I can have any number of more than one, huh? Two, three, four, and a uh, cycle will be waiting forever. So that's a deadlock. It's a fundamental thing, a deadlock. You cannot get around it when you have active entities and resources. Okay? In fact, it happens also in the real world. Uh -huh. Cars at an intersection. The active entity is a car, and the resource is a square on the intersection. So let me make a picture. So here we have an intersection, okay? Okay, we have a car going like this. Uh, we have a car going like this. And here we have a car, it wants to go like this. Here we have a car going like this. And here we have a car going like this. If we have four cars, this also is a deadlock. Eh? The car is an active entity, and each car needs the, the, a square in the intersection. This car needs this piece, so the, the resources are the, the, a part of the, the road that the car has to drive on. So this car, let me call them one, two, three, four. Car one needs this piece, two needs this piece, three needs this piece, and four needs this piece. But four cannot take this piece because there's already a car standing there. And so you have this circular dependency again. So this is an example of a deadlock. And I don't know if you've ever seen that. In big cities, it happens, okay? This is why it's in the, the traffic laws. Normally, you're not allowed to go onto an intersection if there's no way out. Uh, let's say you have lights here. Huh? You have lights, okay, on, this, on the intersection. Okay, uh, but let's say there's many cars here. Uh, all over the place, okay, so the cars are here, and, and there's uh, cars going here. So I go on the intersection, but I cannot leave. And then this guy, 
cannot go on. So the easy way to get a deadlock is to uh, go on the intersection even though you cannot leave. So that's actually not allowed in the traffic code. When you go on to an intersection, you can only go on if you're allowed, if you know you can actually leave, if there's room to leave. Otherwise, you're not allowed to go on because this will create a deadlock. Once you have a deadlock, it's very nasty, okay? Sorry, this goes like this. Assume there's many cars waiting here. There's cars waiting here. Uh, I'm not in the United Kingdom, so there's cars waiting here, and there's cars waiting here. So this is correct for us. Assume there's many cars waiting, so the car cannot back up. This is very nasty, okay? How do you solve this? Well, the cars have to do weird things now. It has to do illegal thing. The car has to try to make room somehow, okay? So this is actually a pain. So the cars have to get out of the way so this one can go around. So this is a deadlock situation. Cars are in intersection, okay? So it's not only on transactions. Any system with active entities that need resources can have deadlocks, okay? And in fact, this is very nasty. In a big transaction system, you can have deadlocks and they say it exist for a long time and nobody notices. So let's say you have a big bank, hundreds of transactions per second, okay, are running. Assume that four transactions are in a deadlock. Fine, they're sitting there waiting. All the others are running. So the system, it looks like it's running, okay? It doesn't look like there's a problem. But part of the system is dead, actually, yeah? So you have to solve this. This is a major problem. And so, I, let me explain. How do you solve it? You have to do something. And there's two ways, two main ways to solve it. And it's like for curing diseases, huh? Either you prevent the occurrence, or you cure it. So prevent it means you never give a lock and a transaction if this might cause a deadlock. Uh, it's like being pessimistic. That's prevention. The, 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 the cure is if you detect a cycle, and when you see a cycle, you force one of the transactions to abort. Uh, so this is called deadlock avoidance or deadlock detection. Those are the two main ways. And you have to do one or the other. You have to do something. But once we solve this, we're done. We have our system. But this is a big problem, okay? So remember our naive manager, which used strict two-phase locking? Let's solve, let's modify it to do deadlock avoidance, okay? Let's use transaction. To do this, we'll add priorities. We have to break the symmetry somehow, huh? We will say earlier transactions have higher priority. Uh, and then we will, oh, there should be only two L's there. When a transaction tries to get a lock, and all, where lock is already taken. So I'm trying to get a lock. You compare the priorities, but somebody else has it. And so now we can actually manage the deadlock. Huh? If I'm trying to get a lock, and the other transaction, which has the lock, is lower priority than me, that I force it to release its lock, and actually I restart it. So I'm not actually aborting it, I cause it to release all its locks, and to restart again, like it's starting from the beginning, okay? And the higher priority transaction gets the lock. So I'm always favoring the high priority ones, okay? And if I'm high priority, if I'm a low priority and I'm asking for a lock, but there's already high priority that has the lock, then the low priority just waits. Okay? So I'm always favoring the high priority, and the lower priority sometimes get restarted. Okay? So you see I'm paying a price. Huh? Sometimes I do more work. Restart means that I reset all the states of the cells, and I start running the transaction again from the beginning and I release all the logs. This works. In this system, no deadlocks will occur because we can prove that the highest priority transaction will never stop, okay? The first transaction that we start in the system has highest priority. Nobody can stop it, okay? 
Uh, if some other transaction has a lock, we will, it will be restarted. The high will always get the lock. Okay? So the highest priority will never be blocked. And eventually, the highest priority will terminate. And then the next one will be the new transaction with highest priority. And so on. Huh? So that means every transaction will eventually have the highest priority and it will not be blocked. So this is a proof by induction, and you can make it formal, huh? that this, in this system no deadlocks will occur. So you need to add this notion of priorities huh? to favor some transaction. It's because the, the, the circle is like a symmetrical thing. You have to make it so it's not completely symmetrical. Some transaction is favored. Huh? With this, we can actually make a correct algorithm. So this algorithm, what I'm showing you now on this slide, this is actually a completely correct algorithm which will never have deadlocks. And how, do you, how does it work? Well, when I make a new transaction, it always has a lower priority than all the ones. Huh? So the transaction priority is always going down. When a transaction tries to get a lock, if the cell is unlocked, you immediately get the lock. Fine. Huh? It's, in that sense, it's optimistic. Huh? If the cell is locked by a transaction with higher priority than me, then I wait. Transaction tells me to wait. If the cell is locked by a transaction with lower priority, oh, the transaction manager will restart the low. Well, basically, it will it will send it a message saying, you must restart. That means it aborts, it forces it to abort, and, and release all its locks. And it starts again with the same priority. So the low priority will not change the priorities. Huh? So the high priority transaction will then get the lock, which has just been released, and continue. So nobody blocks the, highest, the high priority. Okay. Of course, this is, has overhead. Huh? That means all the work that the low priority transaction did before it restarted is wasted. Huh? That's the price. There's no, there's no free lunch for deadlock. There's always some price you have to pay. Okay. And when a transaction commits, it releases all its locks. And maybe there's uh, other transactions waiting on the lock that they get activated again. And when a transaction aborts, okay, it restores its states and then releases its locks. Okay? So this is a full, correct transaction manager. See how it's working? So the, the interesting thing here is this priority thing and the restart. Eh? See how this is working for the deadlock? We can actually make a state diagram. Each transaction is always in one of these states. Okay? So the transaction starts, and then it starts running its code. It's running, okay? And it sometimes needs to ask for a lock. If it gets the lock, then I have this. I ask and I get the lock, and I'm still running, okay? And assume I'm running, and maybe I'm done, okay? I commit a report. But uh, assume I'm asking for a lock that's already taken. Then I go and wait, okay? I wait until the lock is available, and then I get the lock and I go running again. But if, if there's a high priority transaction, higher than me, who needs one of my locks, then I have to restart. Okay. So restart is like a start in the next generation. So there's, again, a copy of the state diagram. So restart is like going back to start. Okay. I, re I release all my locks, I restore all the states, and I start again, okay? So this is in fact one incarnation. So when the algorithm has to restart, it, it starts afresh, so it's the next incarnation. Transaction might go through several incarnations until they commit or abort, okay? So a restart is the start state of the next incarnation. Uh, eventually, it will come into our board. And we can prove that using, using the induction argument from the priorities. So these priorities are like they are the timestamps. Huh? 
So this is needed for liveness. You see, deadlock actually is a problem with liveness. Oh, I'm not sure what happened. The light just went out. Okay. Everyone fine here? I don't know why the light went out. Okay. Some, there's a ghost also listening in and they agree or disagree. Okay, so this works, huh? This is a working algorithm. Let me now show you an optimization of this algorithm. The problem is this algorithm actually is kind of, if you want to implement it, it's kind of nasty because it will terminate a running transaction at an arbitrary part during their execution. Um, if you look at it, high priority needs one of my locks, okay? Uh, uh, but maybe I'm running. Here also I have high priority needs one of my locks. So I have this transition here. If some high priority transaction needs one of my locks and I'm running, then I will be aborted. Boom. Whatever I'm doing, I'm aborted. So this is kind of nasty because I'm aborted at arbitrary time during my execution. Okay, maybe that's okay, but maybe, let's try to make it a little bit better. Because it may be, if you do it wrong, the data structures are not updated correctly, whatever. It's better if we can terminate the transaction at a well-defined point. That means the transaction itself will somehow say, now I term someone wants my, my lock, Okay, I will terminate now at a nice place. Okay, so let me make a small change. Okay, instead of restarting a low priority transaction, we just mark it. We make a mark, and the transaction knows it's marked. And if it tries to get a locked, a lock later on, if it's marked, it will not get the lock, but it will restart. Okay, so this is how. It works, so I'm just adding one extra state here. So if a high priority needs one of my locks, then I keep running. I just keep running, but I'm in a special state called, which I call probation. Huh? It's like a criminal uh, who, let, who they let run in the street, and they, the guy can, can live normally as long as he does not commit any other crimes here. Here, asking for the lock is like a crime. Huh? So the transaction is running normally, and if it finishes, it just finishes. So that's nice, actually. It's a little bit more efficient. But if it asks for a lock, ooh, then it's restarted. So if this transaction dares ask for another lock, then I'm restarting it. Okay? And this way, the transaction will always terminate in a nice place, not in some arbitrary part of the code. Okay, see how that's where it's working there? So that's improved algorithm. And so this one is actually a practical algorithm. And it's also explained in, in the book. Huh? So a transaction in probation state is not allowed to get any more locks. If it tries to get a lock, it restarts. Okay, that's the difference between probation and running. Huh? Because otherwise it's just normally running. This is actually efficient, too, because if the transaction is running, in the previous case, I always abort it, even though if it's almost done. But here, if it's done, it actually finishes normally. So this will actually be a little bit more efficient than the previous one. It will have less, uh, you will have less restarts, okay? Okay, so that's the, the final algorithm. So this one is doing optimistic concurrency control with strict two-phase locking and deadlock avoidance, okay, as I promised you. Uh, and it's a nice algorithm. Of course, there's many possible algorithms. In real systems, there's lots of other ways of doing it. And since in this course you get to see everything, I will also show you how this is actually implemented and I will put the code on the, on the Moodle. We have, uh, we define an abstraction. So these are ACI transactions. Huh? We're not worried about the disk. 
new trends, we'll create a new transaction manager called uh, Trans, uh, sorry, a new transaction manager, and Trans is for doing a transaction, and new cell is for creating a, an abortable cell, okay, new cells. So new cell T, it's a new cell in the transaction, and when I want to do a transaction, I run Trans, and I put the code of the transaction in here, so this is high order, huh? and T is an argument. And this lets me do access, assign, exchange operations on the cells in here. Okay. And I also have an operation called t.abort, which lets me abort. So inside here, I can do any operations I want on these cells. Whenever I need a cell, I have to do new cell t. And I can uh, abort also if I need. Okay. Let me show you now. Let me run this. Run it. So in this course, the idea is that there's no magic. The full code is available. Let me run this code. So here is the actual code for the transaction manager. Let's leap over it quickly. I'm using active objects. So I define the active object. I'm using a Priority queue. So this is an interesting data structure. It's because the transactions have priorities. And when the transactions wait on the locks, well, the high priority ones will be put before the others. So otherwise it's like the queue. Okay. And this is the actual transaction manager. So it's defined as an object because the whole thing is an object, is an active object. So you can see some of the methods here. Unlock all trends. Okay. The, the operation trans, you can see it has an internal data structure for transaction. Here I'm doing exchange, okay? Notice when I do an exchange, I will actually save state, the previous state, okay? And I'm doing actual exchange too. And access assign are actually implemented using exchange. So in the system, there's only one that's really implemented. And I also have abort, okay? Okay. And so here's get lock, new trans, save state, commit abort. So this is new trans. Okay. I will create a new transaction manager, TM. Trans will, uh, when I do a transaction, it creates a new transaction in the transaction manager. R will either be abort, abort, uh, with an exception or commit with a result um, uh, and also I have new cell which lets me create the new cells okay so the cell is actually a cell with a priority queue so these are transactions waiting on the cell the cell has actually a name a constant name because I have to know I have to keep track in a dictionary of all the states so you see there's a lot of uh, bookkeeping going on there huh? to make this work Okay, so here it's all compiled, accepted. Let me now do an example of this execution. Here's some example code. Yeah, no, this is good enough. So I start by creating a new transaction manager called new trans. Now I'm going to make a database. So it'll be a tuple with a thousand elements. Let me just make a database with a thousand elements. Uh, make tuple. And for i is going to a thousand, I create a new cell T, okay, which is a transactional cell. So this is a, a tuple with a thousand transactional cells. And now I can do transactions. So here's a funny transaction, which actually mixes values around, okay. Notice the transactions, the, the, the value of the cell is initialized. So I have a thousand cells numbered from one to a thousand, and each cell has a content of one, two, three, up to a thousand, okay? So cell number 120 will have the content 120. So the numbers in the database are already from one to 1,000, okay? And here I have a transaction which does things. So I create three random numbers, okay? Which are random numbers from one to a thousand, here using the function rand. I get the content of the cells 
using t axis. Uh, I can't use the at symbol. Huh? I have to use this t axis because it's transactional. So a, b, and c are the content of these three cells i, j, and k. And cell i, I will make it a plus b minus c. Cell j, I will make it a minus b plus c. And cell k will be minus a plus b plus c. Notice the total sum is the same. a plus a minus a will be a. b minus b plus b is b. Minus c plus c plus b is c. So this will not change the overall sum. And then to make things kind of more fun, I will add a, a, an abort. If any of these i, j, k are the same, if i is equal to j or i, k or j, k, then I immediately abort. I force the abort here. Means that the i, j, k will always be different. Okay. So basically, I'm mixing around the values here. So you see how that, that's a, just a transaction doing some weird mix. Here's another transaction called sum. I create a new transactional cell, S. And here's a transaction which will actually, uh, first it assigns 0 to the cell S. And then it goes from 1 to 1,000. And it takes the content of S and adds the content of D dot I. So basically, it's, it's summing the values of all 1,000 transactions. It's a sum transaction. And because it's atomic, while it's summing, nobody else is going to interfere. Okay. So this browse sum, it should display the sum of numbers from 1 to 1,000, which is 500,500. Okay. And, and now I will do some transactions, but let me first uh, create this. First let me do this one. Okay. I will create now a database. Okay. Uh, ah, yeah, this is wrong. There was just a typo, sorry. This one will create the database. Should be good. I will define this mix and ramp. Okay. Now I'll define the sum transaction. And now I will do this. I will browse sum. I will do the sum transaction. So this should display, and it does 500,500. And now I will do a very interesting mix here. I will do a thousand concurrent mix transactions. I'm creating a thousand threads, and each thread I do mix. And I don't know what the scheduler is going to do. The scheduler is going to do whatever it does, and it's going to make these thousand transactions. Okay? So I run that. Um, right? It did it. And now this one, it should still display the same number. Okay? But, okay, so maybe you're not convinced. Well, let me actually display the content of this database. So from the first 10 elements, I will display browse d dot i. Okay? So you can see that the values are kind of mixed up. So here are the, the 10 values. You can see they're kind of mixed. It's not 1, 2, 3 up to 10 anymore. They have these weird values after all the mixes, huh? But still, the total sum will be 500,500, because the invariant is maintained. Okay. okay, so I show you the execution, I put the code. So, nothing is hidden. I show you everything, okay? And I actually explain, the, I can explain a little bit the implementation. So it's basically active objects. Each transaction runs in one thread, has one active object, the transaction manager is also an active object, okay? And there's the following messages. Get lock, okay? Save state, okay? Commit and abort. So these are the messages, and there can be replies back, okay? Sync is the return, either it's okay or it's halt. 
or it waits, of course. Huh? Save state, the transaction will save the state, okay? So the transaction manager does three things. It manages the locks, giving or refusing. Refusing will cause the restart then. Managing the states, saving, restoring, and the commit, abort, and restart. So that's what the transaction manager does. So it's kind of this kind of interface, huh? So these are the transactions. This is transaction manager. So they will, the transaction will send a get lock message to the manager. It gets back OK or halt. Maybe this takes some time. Huh? It might wait for this. Huh? It might delay. Save state is for saving the state. And then you can do commit or abort. And that's it. OK? So this is the complete thing. Nothing hidden. I'm not waving my hands. And you can even see what the internal data structure is. Each transaction has an internal record with the timestamps, that's the priority, with the saved states. The saved state is a dictionary containing all the original states of the cells. That's why the cells need names, because they're keys in the dictionary. Okay? You have the body, which is the code. You have the state of the transaction, which is running or waiting on or probation. So that's the state. Okay? And here is the cell. Each cell internally also has a record, so each cell has a name. You need it because you have this dictionary of the states. Each cell has a, an owner. This is the transaction that is currently locking the cell. You have a queue, a priority queue of transactions waiting for the lock. And then you have the cell's current state. So you see a lot of data for just one cell. Huh? And the priority queue is a queue whose entries are ordered by priorities. So it's exactly like the queue, except when you add it to the queue, with the in queue here, you give an integer priority P. And when you remove by the DQ, you will remove first the entry with the smallest value of P. So you can put in the entries in any order you want, but they will all filter so the, the smallest value of P comes out first. Okay. Uh, you can also force it to remove an entry with priority P if it exists, and you can tell whether it's empty. Okay. So the highest priority waiting transaction will get the lock when it's released because you have this priority queue. And that's it. Then now you know everything. And if you read the code, you'll see exactly how it works. Okay? So if you have any doubt that what I'm telling you bogus things, just look at the code. It's all there. Okay, I'm not hiding anything. Everything is open, huh? So now I just make a small conclusion. Transactions are large atomic actions with asset properties used for large databases. They have safety and liveness, but they also need resilience, performance, and scalability, okay? And concurrency control is the techniques for building them. And we showed you here a full algorithm that does optimistic concurrency control with strict two-phase locking and deadlock avoidance. So now you can impress people with a lot of buzzwords, okay? This is actually the most complicated algorithm in the book. Uh, it's a two-page algorithm, and it was a real pain writing that algorithm. I can tell you, uh, testing it done. But, uh, but as far as I know, it works. Okay, so that's all. Thank you very much.